This is Steve Orlands, President of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I'm pleased today to be joined by a very old friend. In fact, we were trying to remember when we first met, which was probably in the 1990s or 80s even. Uh, but he, today he is joining us because he is the author of an extraordinarily comprehensive look at China's economy from the beginning. Reading this book kind of took me back many, many years ago. In fact, it took me back to when I first went to China, Bert, in, in, uh, in 79, but then took me back to when I was studying China um, in oh. the late 60s, early 70s. But it is China's economic challenge, unconventional success. Uh, the author is Albert Keitel, um, who's an adjunct professor at GW and a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Um, I think I first knew him and he was working at US Treasury as the, uh, I think, director of what I call the East Asian Bureau and before that at the, at the China desk. Um, before that, he was at the World Bank in the late 90s. So he speaks from a position of real knowledge um, and the book really at this time when there is so much uh, distortion about China's economy, this book really gets down to the facts, it gets down to the data. Um, now I gave the title, so let me start with the first question. Uh, the title calls it an unconventional success. That's probably not the view of the US uh, kind of think tank community today. today. Tell us why you call it an unconventional success and what the book's themes are that address those issues. Well, thank you. And Steve, first of all, thank you and the National Committee for uh, hosting this. I'm very grateful. The unconventional success, that's two words, success. I don't think anybody doubts that China has been a successful growth experience. It's 40-fold growth in 40 years uh, and has lifted enormous share of its population out of poverty, 100% if we measure it in the way they did uh, by 2020. Unconventional, uh, because it didn't rely on just allowing market forces to liberalize and do what they would do. It has a significant role for government guidance, and it breaks a lot of the, you would say, sort of typical approaches uh, that developing countries are taking. Uh, simple ones are control of the capital account. Uh, they have to do with how to finance uh, local infrastructure projects with uh, conduit finance, which, you know, New York's uh, public spending is about 90% uh, conduit finance for their projects. Well, China has taken that approach of having a lot of local companies uh, borrow for infrastructure projects. It has a, an important role for a national development bank uh, to jumpstart a lot of projects with uh, seed money. Uh, and it has uh, really regulated the financial system in a way to help raise the investment rate in GDP well over 40%. Uh, and that's one of the themes of the book that to China's success uh, has accomplished something a lot of countries just cannot accomplish, which is to raise the investment rate to a high level of the type that Japan and South Korea did uh, in earlier decades when they were over 30%. Uh, so it, the, the combination of a high rate of investment and really interventionist counter cyclical demand, those two parts of the picture are what have made China success rather than stressing liberalization, open portfolio flows, liberalization, complete liberalization of the financial industry. China's financial industry is geared towards helping the country invest both in public projects and to encourage uh, the for-profit sector, which is quite large. So in that way, I'm saying it's unconventional because uh, it doesn't really meet the standards of the liberalizing um, th theories about economic development. And so the book is about economic development. How do you get a poor country uh, up and out of poverty? Doesn't government intervention in these areas, even though one can argue it's success, doesn't it create what I call rent seeking opportunities that because government is playing an area where the, the market should be determining it, it allows for a level of corruption that is very significant. 
Well, uh, that's right. And uh, that, but what do we mean by corruption that is significant? There are levels of corruption. I have a, a marvelous chart in the book uh, that takes the Transparency International measures of corruption and correlates them with uh, per capita GDP. And of course, you just get the richer you are, the less corruption you have by that measure. But if you take the average uh, and it becomes just a line through all of these dots, China has moved significantly to the less corrupt side uh, for the average of all countries at its development stage. Uh, and it doesn't mean that it's gotten rid of corruption. There's a, and they also prosecute corruption. Uh, but we've also seen uh, strong moves against what is a deeper and more systematic corruption, which is where wealthy institutions, in particular in finance or in the corporate structure, uh, work to deregulate the system so that they can make more money and to harm the income distribution. And this was what happened with Ant and Jack Ma uh, last year. He spoke up about the regulatory system for his financial activities being too harsh. Uh, and that crossed a line that we, uh, we know here as Citizens United about the degree to which wealth can influence public policy and institutional makeup. Uh, so the, they're, they're, they're at work on corruption. Corruption is endemic throughout the world. Uh, and the question is how bad? And the book really gives a, a measure, which is something uh, we don't see done very well elsewhere. The crackdown on ant, one could argue, is one of the reasons why China's uh, economic growth has slowed to the extent that it has. That ant had come up in effect with a micro, almost a micro finance uh, product that allowed for people to borrow money. And when that kind of has become restricted, um, you know, obviously doesn't affect the big state-owned enterprises, but it certainly does affect SMEs and and small you know, good people, small you know small businesses. Um, you think that was the right decision? Yes, there is a uh, there's an issue with any kind of financial institution as to how well uh, it's managing its assets uh, and supervising the assets it has influence over to avoid a crisis uh, and there were concerns that Ant wasn't very well regulated. And this, of course, is what Jack Ma was speaking to, uh, that he was going to be regulated too heavily. But there are very good reasons for financial regulation all around the world to look at composition of assets, uh, to look at how their quality, uh, to make sure that they're not building into bubbles that can burst. Uh, and so I think that was what the Chinese, this was a new phenomenon. It actually was introduced into China by foreign financial interests, particularly from Japan. And Jack Ma was sort of their, their front guy uh, in China. Uh, and it, it, it's, a, it's a very important phenomenon. FinTech, of course, is the way the Chinese have developed it and the rest of the world is catching up to have it be so seamless to be able to do so much with your cell phone uh, or your computer, including borrowing money for your small company. These are wonderful technical breakthroughs the Chinese have pioneered. Uh, but they have to be regulated. They cannot be allowed to grow into uh, dangerous compositions of asset holdings that aren't people aren't aware of. Uh, and so we have run into this this issue of regulatory uh, competency uh, in, in various countries around the world, particularly back in the financial crisis. And so I I think it was the right decision. It doesn't mean that Ant isn't going to operate, uh, but it punished him and Ant. Uh, by then denying him the right to raise funds on the New York Stock Exchange. But it was a, a clear message that we are not going to stand for a, a private financial institution that wants to be more freewheeling to tell us how to regulate our financial sector. Mm -hmm. Even though in the United States and other places, you know, the regulated institutions have regular conversations with the regulator to determine the best way to make sure there is not systemic financial risk. I would also, you know, I think in Ant's case, they're probably, you know, the, it's one of those areas where the benefits of technology, you know, I, I spent time doing leverage buyouts, you know, the, the credit risk is the toughest part of an analysis. The more data I had, the better the chances that I would not make a mistake. And because of the data that Ant Financial had, 
it had an ability to kind of uh, reduce credit risk in a way that probably it didn't exist at a time when when I was a banker or you were at Treasury. Well, also, this is a great example of what Xi Jinping's strategy has been over the last, or the, the government under Xi Jinping, because I think Xi Jinping's policies, so-called, are really the product of an enormous policy-making process, both within the party and within the government. And that process over the last 10 years, since the financial crisis, in the analysis in this book, is to get ready for a major investment uh, explosion in urbanization to try to merge the rural and the urban labor forces, which will be very expensive, require a lot of housing, a lot of water, a lot of sewer, a lot of electric power, a lot of highways, subways, and so forth, a lot of construction, but also the integration of labor. And the one barrier to doing that is the financial sector. It's too porous. The Chinese call it the waterbed financial sector because you put money in over here, but it squirts up over there. Uh, and that, so that's a that's a, almost a technical term the Chinese have. And so what they've had to do over this last year and have avoided pouring money into major urban projects because they're afraid they'll go into high-end speculative housing or they'll go into the stock market or they'll go into capital flight. And so they've been working on the interbank market that has been a, a pathway for uh, shadow finance and the shadow banking system to move money around in ways that avoid what its public purpose is. And they gotten pretty close to that by 2019. Uh, and they were ready, they were announcing, I think at your meeting uh, early in 2020, when I was there, they were saying, we finally getting movement now on the urbanization, on the hukou reforms. Uh, and it looks like we're getting going. And then of course, COVID was already underway that January of 2020 in New York when we were there. And so I think that is their plan for the next decade, is to, is to integrate the rural and urban areas, an enormous project, but to do it, they need to have a financial sector they can trust. And so I think in the last 10 years, and this includes Evergrande, you know, the, the, the whole real estate uh, asset situation to try to tighten that up so that it's not dangerous. Uh, and, and so this Jack Ma and uh, the fintech regulatory process is part of the shadow finance system that needs regulatory uh, strengthening. If the, the real reform, a really tough reform, and your, your guest, you know, a few, I guess a few months ago, uh, has focused so much on rural needs and rural integration, has stressed that with the China's economy cannot operate optimally if its rural labor force is not integrated into the formal sector. And so that big job is ahead of China. Now it's gonna be expensive and right now it's held up by COVID. And then I, when, when that is over, I think that is gonna be, and that, that of course is very different outlook that I'm proposing from the one we're hearing from, it's, you know, it's amazing. So you know, as many as a dozen outlets recently are talking about the trouble the Chinese economy is in and that COVID has really knocked it down. And you can look at the slow <clears> growth <throat> rates and the declining productivity, so forth. I, I, I don't want to disparage a lot of that, but most of those, if not all, are written by political, political scientists. And they're looking at a lot of what I would think are more superficial tendencies when the fundamentals are really strong, that China still has a high rate of investment in GDP, a good grip on what aggregate demand looks like, and inflation is very low. So that uh, I, I think this is the kind of thing going forward that we can expect. Mm -hmm. Anything, obviously you've been working on this for so long, anything surprise you in kind of pulling the book together? I think the, the sophistication of the fiscal system uh, impressed me. Uh, when I began to do the data, for example, Chinese introduced a value added tax, which we knew was a good revenue raiser. And so that governments that are trying to do a lot of development, they need money. And, uh, and, a, and, a, and an efficient tax system is critical. So they introduced a, in the mid 1990s, a, a value added tax, which of course Europe had done long before and, and, and helped, uh, for example, Maggie Thatcher raise a lot of money that uh, they hadn't expected her to. But they did something also very interesting. They then, the central government took most of the tax revenue and then informally turns it back to the provinces and called Fan Huan. And uh, that is, is kind of an invisible way of redistributing money. So that when I did a chart that's a table that's in the book uh, that showed what share of the domestic budget is this returned money from the center 
it's very small for Shanghai and Beijing, but it's almost the whole budget for Tibet uh, and Guizhou and the very poor areas in the West. So there was this redistributional process uh, that I found actually, it may break rules because you should be transparent, which is what a lot, and this process gets criticism uh, that it's not transparent. But if you're moving money to where it needs to be from a public purpose point of view, uh, that's going to, that could be interpreted to be hurting those that are better off and have to give up those funds, uh, why make it transparent? Why not just let it happen? And, and that's what this system in China does. There's a real sophistication in accomplishing a difficult task that I, I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see. The book, what does the book tell us about China's future economy? What it will look like? Uh, you, you talk about and don't really opine, you say many feel that, that China uh, GDP will be double what the United States is in 2050. Do you think that is what is going to happen? Do you think that's where we're headed? You know, what do I know? Uh, I, there's a table uh, that re redoes a table I did when I was the Carnegie Endowment, uh, well, you know, 14 years ago or so, uh, that takes the China's economy in this decade, in this century, by 10 year jumps. And it starts out historically through 2020 uh, in 10 year jumps. And then it hypothesizes, I, I call it an illustration of what could be, but it makes the US growth rate hopefully improve to about two and a half percent a year on an average growth rate. It, it's very optimistic in some people's minds, but if I, if I look at the Chinese economy where it's you know, aiming at five and a half percent or maybe now four and a half percent, Going through this crisis, um, I say seven percent for the coming for this decade, and then decelerating after that, you do get an economy that's twice the size of the U.S. economy. But remember, a lot of that is labor-intensive uh, services. Uh, what you don't get is an elevation of China's per capita GDP to match the United States until the very end of this, until the year 2100. So that that's a proxy for technical sophistication, China stays behind the U.S. for the whole century. Why do you think, as you and I were talking before, why do you think this book, which again, I think 15 years ago, would be right within where the consensus of U.S. economists are, is now outside the consensus? What's going on? Why is this book almost an outlier? The book is an outlier and, the, and it describes why it's an outlier when it discusses the trade war with the United States. And it states that there was some shift in terms of the pivot under the Obama administration to look at China. And some, I'm told, uh, explain that as a way to help soften the withdrawal from the Middle East to know that we're not withdrawing from the world, we're pivoting to Asia. But when President Trump came into office, and on the night of his election, when took a phone call from Tsai Ing-wen, the, you know, the president of the government in Taiwan, uh, he, as the BBC said, he broke all previous protocol. And then he began to use uh, the Taiwan issues and he began to use China as a bad actor. He got it wrong at first. He said it was an exchange rate problem, but uh, Secretary of Treasury Mnuchin had to say to him, no, no, the Chinese are intervening in the right direction now. The exchange rate is not an issue. So he basically shifted and that China's just a big cheater and we can't let him do this. And it was part of his election campaign, which was to be critical of everything every president before him had done, <clears throat> whether it was immigration or, you know, you know, military contributions from our NATO allies, that he was negative about everything that had gone before, and China was just one of them. Uh, but the, I think the, the, the security interests in the U.S. has some enormously sophisticated technologies, particularly in the Navy, uh, where we have an unmanned uh, Navy program that is it's, it's, it's extraordinary, it's marvelous, uh, but it needs a lot of money. I think there was a pickup then in China as a bad actor. A lot of people jumped on board. Uh, and I'd, I'd seen this when I was with Treasury, when the exchange rate issue came up immediately, all the companies that were competing with China uh, said, yes, we need help too. And you had a big political effort. But I think what happened in the Trump administration was a lot of negativity, putting pressure on it. And then it moved into the human rights area. Uh, 
And you had Secretary of State Pompeo with an envelope. I have here proof of, of genocide in, in, uh, in Xinjiang uh, that was immediately picked up by a lot of people as a symbol of uh, how evil China is. And there is a, 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 a sort of a potential and a quick start description of China as really, really bad guys. Uh, that is not justified by the facts. Uh, and so when, you, when that was triggered by Trump, President Trump and Secretary of State Pompeo uh, in their administration, it got picked up. And uh, sadly, I think the Biden administration, uh, looking at the political situation in America today, uh, doesn't want to counter that and appear to be soft on China. So that there's a, there's a movement in China now that it's really evil. Uh, there's the sense that China began to put pressure on Taiwan when, of course, it was a response to the Trump uh, initiative uh, that China saw so threatening and breaking the rules, as the BBC said. Uh, so in, in, that, in this world context right now, uh, China is such a bad actor uh, in ways that I think are uh, unsubstantiated uh, that this book is an outlier because it just comes in with the facts, just comes in with documented information about what has happened and why. As you've kind of made reference to in your comments and what the book says explicitly, China avoided the wholesale liberalization of its economy and the concomitant risk of empowering wealth at the expense of good government. Uh, those who believe in the free market think the opposite, that state intervention allows for rent seeking, allows for corruption. In fact, good government is basically allowing the markets to determine, not having bureaucrats sitting in government, making those decisions and having the risk of having these enormous amounts of money being decided by them. And some people choosing, well, maybe I'll take a percent or two or three. And when you're dealing with a trillion, that's a material amount of money. Well, yes, that's right. But I, I think that uh, perception, that conviction is exactly what I'm talking about, uh, that, that, that good markets need good government and they need to be well regulated. They need to have features that allow uh, or, or that don't allow uh, wealth then to tilt government in the direction of that same wealth. And I think that is something that's critical for a healthy democracy and a healthy market is to avoid the process, the political economic process by which economic success in a weakly regulated market can compound uh, the degree to which there is a concentration of wealth at the top. And so I think it's an issue for all democracies to try to make sure they don't have an economy that allows that concentration at the top, because if you do, the dissatisfaction at the lower ends and in the middle will become so serious that it will become explosive. Uh, and we will have uh, really then real dangers to democracy and to healthy markets. Now, the, the preface is from February of 2022, so very, very recent. When did the research on the book in effect stop? Did it stop in February of this year or was it prior to that? And if so, well, first that question, then I'll ask a follow up. Well, this, I've been writing this for 12 years and I got a grant to do a lot of work in China after the financial crisis to understand China's role in the financial crisis. But I have been covering the Chinese economy on a regular monthly quarterly basis since the uh, early 1980s uh, for Wharton Econometrics and then for my own company, Rock Creek Research. Uh, and then as a consultant and a contractor for the World Bank, uh, maintaining all kinds of databases. And so I just maintained that same coverage of China while I looked at policy changes and began to figure out I had the manuscript was double the size of this book. Uh, so when I finally found a, a publisher that was willing to wrestle with it, uh, they said, you've got to cut it in half. Uh, but I kept, you'll, you'll find data in it uh, for 2020 because I still subscribe to everything that I get. And I was able to add it to the charts and say, oh, here's what happened. And it covers the, the COVID crisis in a way that describes how China has coped with that and the, uh, and the, the, the zero lockdown or COVID zero uh, approach, uh, which, you know, by the way, China has, has its whole labor force intact. 
because it has allowed the virus to die out in most of the country. That's a, that for, for maintaining an internal supply chain uh, and, and coherent growth, an intact labor force that hasn't been vitiated by long drawn out crises, uh, that's the secret of China's current strength. Yeah, so the, the zero COVID tolerance policy is one which I think is subsequent. Its real effects are being experienced now. And I think the jury is out on what the economic consequences are. Certainly. Oh, but I just read, I just read uh, a piece by the, the lead World Bank writer for the report that came out on, on, on June 7th and was saying that, yes, this is a dilemma China has to face. Uh, the trade-off between COVID zero or zero COVID and, and what the impact on the economy. And the, in the next sentence said, by relaxing this COVID, zero COVID policy would do more damage to the economy than not. Uh, and I, I, heard, I heard a Shanghai, a Shanghai uh, man the other day, just a couple of days ago, say that he's from Shanghai. He hears from his relatives and everything about how tough it is. Uh, and he sympathizes, but his wife is from Tianjin. And she says, what's wrong with these Shanghai people? You know, can't they have a little difficulty for the for the nation? Wuhan did it. Why can't Shanghai do it? So I, th I think there's a, there's a, a really an open issue here. Relaxing. You can, I think it's important. You can't talk about the zero tolerance policy without talking about China's uh, policy with respect to mRNA vaccines, with respect to importing those vaccines. Uh, I. To tr in truth, I remain simply uh, gobsmacked that the Chinese government has not imported the mRNA vaccines. It's, it's, if they did, if they had a massive vaccine campaign, which you and I know they could do, uh, they could end the zero COVID policy without enormous risks to their population. Well, I think the, the big difference is, is they're elderly, but they just haven't vaccinated a good number of their elderly citizens. They're not forcing them to. They're trying to make it more voluntary. Now, I think it could be that the side effects of their vaccine based on dead virus uh, is maybe harsher than the side effects of, uh, of the MNRI, but I, I, I don't know that. I'd like some scientific information on that. But I, I, the issue is how to get their elderly vaccinated. The problem is because there wasn't widespread COVID in China, the data that we have from China is not great and they haven't had enough of release of that data from other places to allow us to make sensible decisions. Now, the WHO thinks it was effective enough to be approved, as was the Sputnik, the Russian vaccine, as were a bunch of other vaccines. Let me, let me just, uh, you know, I think we've given the viewers a great taste of what is in the book. It is really, it's, it's just a terrific read from, and it takes you from the very beginning to the present, which is terrific. But talk a little bit about what's going on economically between the U.S. and China, how U.S. inflation uh, is going to affect China, how the Fed having this enormous increase in um, the, the Federal Reserve rate, uh, day before yesterday um, is going to affect China. The, I think China will have to work hard to insulate itself from several things that are happening, right? In addition to the U.S. Uh, fighting inflation with high interest rates, which would cause some capital flight uh, and, and some serious capital flight. China's therefore, you know, had to work instead of lowering interest rates to try to stimulate its economies had to work with more quantitative measures to keep its interest rate up. Also, the war in Ukraine, the inflation on, on food grains in, uh, around the world and how to affect China. China has had a strategy that I've been arguing against, I guess, since the early 1980s of self-sufficiency in human feed, food grains. Uh, they import a lot of feed for animals. Uh, but they are adamant, and I think it had to do with some U.S. statements in the early 80s that we could influence China by preventing imports of grain or something. But they, if you look at the work in this book about the price of grain uh, and the profits, there are zero profits for planting grain. And you get, you get a you know, very rich reward for planting vegetables and fruits and, and fish ponds and so forth. But the government has maintained pressure uh, or requirements 
for planted area of grain so that they make sure that they don't get influenced by that. So I, I think China will, we've seen China's exports doing very well recently. Uh, that has a lot to do with the health of the rest of the economy. Uh, but China's economy has never been export-led. That's something the book explains and, and shows very clearly. It has instead been domestically driven. So they have their own economic cycle of a boom when they try to push some infrastructure projects or when they respond, for example, the SARS epidemic in 2003-04. Uh, they've had these booms and then they have to rein in the inflation. Those are not uh, consistent with the U.S. growth rate. If you look at the U.S., it slumps in the early 1990s. So does Germany, so does Japan, so does uh, South Korea and so forth. China is booming at that time because they're coming out of the slowdown after the Tiananmen violence. And then you get the US dot-com boom. China is collapsing its growth rate down to, at that point, very what they considered very low rates because it had to fight inflation uh, when they influenced the, uh, when, when they, when they in, in 1991, 92, they liberalized grain uh, and, and cooking oil prices. This is before Deng took his famous trip to the South. It was an extraordinary reform right after Tiananmen. Uh, and, it, and it created a really wealthy rural area. There was like a Keynesian boom that they could not control until they forced them to plant grain again, and that reduced their income. So by the late middle to late 1990s, China was in a growth slump. The US was booming. So there, there wasn't this export led growth following the US export demand that other countries had relied on. I mean, exports were really important. They needed that earnings to buy technology. Uh, but so China right now is in this same position. It has these mechanisms to be able to control and influence domestic demand in a counter cyclical way. And I think they will come through uh, the, the global tribulations now by applying, as I said at the outset, they have uh, for, they've done for 40 years a whole series of processes and, and, and perfected them, and they're still in operation. Their, their, their model is not in a crisis, uh, and they will apply it once the COVID situation is uh, resolved satisfactorily uh, and keep going. Last question, because we're out of time. Uh, we have the 20th Party Congress in this autumn. After what should we expect? expect? Are there any surprise? I guess by definition, surprise we don't expected, but what should we expect in terms of economic policy after the 20th Party Congress? And I know that's no, a 20 my minutes answer, answer, but my answer is going to be not it's going to be boring. There will be continuity with what has been going on. Uh, as I said, up to uh, the process of 2019, they were getting ready for a major policy initiative that had required controlling the shadow financial system. Uh, and if you look at the policies then Xi Jinping first came into office, they're all, they, they're, the continuity there is so strong with what went on in the Hu Jintao policy. The, 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 the model projects in the South uh, have been expanded into China 2025. Uh, and I, I expect that they will they will continue with their long term plan. And I, I think Xi Jinping will be secretary general again because he's he's doing a good job. When he stops doing a good job, they'll they'll find somebody else. Interesting. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for writing this book, China's Economic Challenge, Unconventional Success. I'm sure it will be read by both policymakers, students, and experts, because there's really very few books that are written um, on kind of the full sweep of China's economic policy since 1949. And you really have done that and done a masterful job of pulling it all together. But Bert, thank you so much. Steve, that's very kind of you. Thank you. And it's been a real pleasure and an honor uh, to speak with you. Thank you again.